you look up in the night sky, there it is. The asteroid. The Armageddon event. It's coming. No avoiding it. The earth is doomed. You make your way to your pre-designated cave. Yeah, you should be grateful you got one, right? Door locks behind you. The weather shifts to a constant temperature and a constant humidity forever for the rest of your life. How will you cope? Welcome to what? Is it about the weather podcast where we explore the many ways that weather intertwines itself into our lives? I'm your host, Mark Jelinek. Hope you're having a good weather week. It's been unusual out there. Yes, I'm, I know I'm still off schedule. And even tonight when I was recording, I was trying to get the microphone to work. Always the hazards of being on the road, trying to do things, right? Equipment, I, I do take the same equipment with me. So you'd think I'd be good. But it gets shoved into places. And I was like, okay, why isn't the microphone coming on? Why isn't the microphone coming on? And, well, it's because there is an on-off switch and it was off. But I think I got that resolved. So hopefully everything will be okay. Hope the sound quality has been okay the past couple of weeks. I promise to be back to my regular setup, if you will, <laughs> this coming weekend. And we'll hopefully get an episode out a little quicker next time around. We'll get back closer to the regular schedule, which, you know, is somewhere in that Friday to Sunday range. I like to get it done. Get it out there. Put new thoughts, new ideas. It's been, from a weather standpoint, mine has been a crazy week, though. So I went from really hot since the last time we talked. I mean, like really hot, you know, 100 degree Fahrenheit type of hot to comfortable mornings, you know, in the 60 Fahrenheit range, dry, to made my way back to the eastern U.S., back to the south. Now, I grew up in the south, and I'm used to it, but that doesn't mean that when I walk out of the hotel, I don't go, oh, I don't miss this. So one of the reasons I, you know, didn't have a problem with moving away from the south is I didn't particularly like southern summers, and it, it really has to do with the idea that dew points and temperatures end up being the same thing. So you walk out, and you, you know, maybe you've experienced this before. Anybody from the south certainly has. But you go through about two to three months, depending on what part of the south you're in, and, and actually, you know, you can go to parts of Florida, and it's even more often that, where, you know, you walk out the door, right, and you're just walking to your car and you feel like you lose 10 pounds because the minute you're doing out there, you're not, you know, we talked about this, this, uh, wet bulb kind of concept. You can't, uh, nothing evaporates, right? It's, it's, you're saturated and immediately you just, everything you're in is drenched. And I, I don't know, just, it, I, it, I could see it coming to, that's always the funnier part, right? Cause you'll see condensation on like glass doors or things, particularly that aren't double paned, and so they're really at that outdoor temperature, uh, and you kind of get the condensation, and you go, oh, this is not going to be good. And usually it's not, but eh, we learn to adjust. I could have worse things, right? I've got to experience a lot of interesting weather. Had some, some neat thunderstorms that I got to witness, uh, and, you know, interesting, you know, hot summer wind sort of thing. But, yeah, was just driving through the plains in the U- U.S. and, you know, cars getting blown all over the place. But I enjoy that kind of stuff. We know that, right? That's not new for me. Not everybody, you know, gets a big kick out of that stuff like I do. And there's certainly been some noteworthy weather going on around the globe, right? We had floods in Germany, floods in China. And, you know, the China flood, I mean, it was... It was one of those flash flood things. And, and I'll put it in perspective for people in the U.S. Maybe a few years ago you remember about Hurricane Harvey, and there was talk about rainfall in kind of the Houston area, the greater area around Houston. And hourly rates were somewhere in the 7 10 to 10 inches for some places, not not the whole time. That was like the max value. Now, they got more total, but the China flooding was a lot like that, just to give you an idea. You know, people got trapped and killed in subway systems. I, you know, it's just, it's been sort of wild. And we've had this heat kind of coming and going in the U.S. Back where I was last week, it's even hotter this week, right? So you got all that going on. So it's, it's, it's kind of crazy out there. There's no doubt about it. But I had some weather stuff from that trip that I thought would make sense to bring 
into this episode. All right. And the idea is pretty simple. So part of the goal of the trip was to visit national parks. Now that's you know not something that everybody does, but there's plenty of people out there, many of which are listening to this that have done probably similar trips where you, you go and you see if you will. We decided to do more than just a couple. And we were also trying to do the idea of that everybody's getting out, you know, starting to travel again post COVID and we can see by the infection rates going up again. But everybody's trying to get out and enjoy places that they weren't able to go. And because no one can really travel internationally, particularly easily right now, they're hitting a lot of local domestic sites. So I avoided places like, let's say, the Grand Canyons or Yellowstone, those sort of things that might be well known. And I went to South Dakota, the Upper Plains, and hit some things like Badlands and uh, one that I wasn't planning to, Theodore Roosevelt National Park, right? And some other things like, again, not everything's a national park. Some of them are national. Again, Devil's Tower, it's a really neat thing. I enjoyed doing that. It's kind of an iconic thing from movie, you know, UFO movie way back in the 70s. Oh, I'm dating myself again. In any case, went around, did a variety of things. And one of the places that was on the list that's in that vicinity is a place called Wind Cave National Park. It's in northwestern corner of South Dakota. And there's another one that's a national monument called Jewel Cave. So these two cave systems. Now, I haven't done a lot of caving before, right? I haven't spent a lot of time, you know, spelunking, right? But the ones I have done have been what I think of as kind of my norm of with stalactites and stalagmites, right? So you've got water dripping down and it's it's forming these deposits as it kind of drips down and it can form them from the ceiling or up from the ground. Just depends on where you are and what, what you know, how the water's flowing, that sort of thing. And it might be in both directions, right? They can even come together. That was my frame of reference with caves. So I've not done, and there's some other caves like Carlsbad Caverns that, you know, are cave-like. There's Mammoth Cave um, in Kentucky here in the U.S. I've also been to, but I'd never have been in the cave. So it was another one that you know, was kind of on the list to go back to, but it, it's not going to happen this trip. In any case... Went to both these caves. They're slightly different setup, but what's really wild about them is they are very wide open. They don't have those types of formations I'm used to. Each one of them was a little different. One had a certain type of, you know, deposits and that sort of thing. The other one had another thing. But these places are huge. I mean, they're just enormous. And the one thing that was similar in both cases was the idea of temperature and pressure not pressure, temperature and, and humidity basically being the same. Pressure, actually, it, we'll get to that. It's a little different, um, or, or it varies, but it doesn't vary all that much. It, it just is more a reflection of what's going on outside in terms of the wind. So there is there can be wind. Depends on how the openings are structured, but both these caves have what would be called a natural entrance, which means wind could get in and get out. And not surprisingly, it works just like the regular atmosphere when the pressure is lower in the cave, right, or higher in the cave. That dictates whether air is flowing in or flowing out, okay? Not a big surprise there. But generally speaking, even with that wind flow, which happens around the entrance, aside from that, these two caves, different structures, even slightly different elevations and depths and that sort of thing, were more or less the same temperature and same humidity. Okay. And it, you know, yes, the little, the ranger tour guides made it sound like it never changes. Now I know it changes some, particularly when you're in one cave, we did two tours in one of the locations and one of them quoted one temperature and humidity. Another one quoted another temperature humidity. So clearly, you know, it, it's either always slightly different, you know, from one to the other. <laughs> Um, doesn't really matter. The gist of the, the story is, for the most part, it just doesn't change. It's, it's a pretty set thing, right? Now, just to put in perspective with caves, you know, one of the things you have with going underneath ground is a little bit like going above ground. So you've probably heard me mention before that we get these things called temperature inversions in the atmosphere, right? in the, particularly in the lower levels. And quite often it's common 
earlier in the day. Sometimes they dissipate as the day goes on. But it is part of the thing, and, and they can happen at different levels of the atmosphere. And quite frankly, it's one of the things that kind of keeps hot air rising indefinitely, right? At some point, it reaches an equilibrium, and sometimes that's hit, or it hits a wall, and you see these inversions, and that might be where you see clouds form, so you can understand where the cloud level is based on where these inversions are. But it can also be the difference between, you know, snow and freezing rain and sleet in the wintertime, depending on where this inversion is. And it basically just means instead of the temperature cooling as you're going in the atmosphere for a little bit, it actually increases. It could be where you see frontal boundaries, because as you, you may or may not be aware, when fronts come through, there's this nose with them. They're not necessarily right at the surface. They tend to be slightly above the surface where the, the temperature extreme is, if you will. So you can see uh, a frontal boundary in, in the schematics we use to, to see where these little noses are, if you will. But that kind of nose in, inverts underneath ground. So underneath ground, near the surface, it's warm, but then it cools a little bit before it starts getting warm again as you go deeper into the Earth's core. As we all know, it's you got magma down there, right? So it's pretty warm and you know the core aside from that but all that kind of heat actually gets trapped up between all this liquid layer and the bedrock of the earth okay so more or less very little of that heat that's actually in the middle of the earth ever gets to the surface it's it's a tiny minuscule amount and it moves very slowly so most of the heating that we experience on the earth happens from the sun and actually the sun's heating or the you know the solar heating that comes to the planet does go beneath the ground, but it also does it very slowly. But but those things, we can actually understand a lot about past climates and those sort of things by understanding how that heat moves into the earth. But in short, what it means is this is why when you go below ground, you tend to have the temperature structure is pretty stable and it goes colder before, like I said, it gets warm again. So that's the opposite of getting warm and going cold in the atmosphere. So it's just kind of a flip effect. I could draw a diagram, but you hopefully can imagine it. But the idea, again, is pretty straightforward. If you lived underground, and I, you know, I use the example that many sci-fi movies do, and, you know, it's we store all this stuff in caves and everybody locks themselves in. It's even games like Fallout, right? The big popular gaming series. The whole idea is you're in these shelters after, you know, the nuclear war that happened and you lived underground for a certain amount of time and then the shelter's going to go up and everybody's going to go back to the earth. But in the meantime, a lot of people lived out their lives. And I've always, you know, wondered God, how weird would that be? So I, I watched the movie, and yeah, I can watch watch that component, but I always imagine, what, what would it really be like being in the cave? You don't have to have a, the good news is you don't have to have heating, you don't have to have air conditioning, you might want some heating because it's a little cold. Like the cave I was in was, you know, somewhere in the order of, I think it was somewhere around 55 Fahrenheit, I don't remember the exact number, humidity was around 90%. It felt comfortable to me, especially since it was really hot days. So the tour actually ended about the time I finally cooled off. But you could even choose to do that. Now, some people in some places, they'll build homes into the side of the earth for that reason. They, they get the benefit. And you've heard me mention when we've talked about air conditioning and, and how we cool things and, and heating as well. There's a system called a heat pump, and it, it leverages that. It leverages the idea that the temperature underneath the ground is kind of at this constant level, right? And you use you know a water just like you would almost like a radiator system. And depending on whether you want it hotter or colder, is which direction it goes, or you, you know, you're pulling air out of the, the house or, or heat out of the house, or you're introducing heat in and cooling in the opposite. But fundamentally, if you lived in a cave or one of these bunkers or, or safety things, your temperature would be roughly the same. Now, as I always ex also experienced, it could get really dark, right? But let's assume that, you know, you've got enough power to let it last forever, whatever it is. Would you get bored with missing weather I don't, I don't know I mean for me I would I would go this is crazy it's always the same and, and I think I'm not the only person that goes a little nuts so if, if things are always the same but maybe the vast majority of the world would think oh it's great I don't I don't have to think about the weather I don't have to think about what I'm going to put on from a temperature standpoint or whether it's going to rain all right now 
The reason I bring this up is I'm going to bring the opposite scenario to you. So I mentioned these two different cave systems, and one of them, one of them when you're learning about you know, the entrance and how it was discovered, you also thankfully learn a little bit about the indigenous people's view of this cave. And one tribe in the area, the Lakota tribe, has an interesting origin story that has to do with this cave, and it's about where their people came from. Now, I'm not going to get into all the names, but it did make me think about maybe a, a history and weather thing related to um, the American indigenous peoples, because they, they have fascinating stories, and I always enjoy hearing these stories. And I, I came across a book that had something to do with weather. I need to get a copy of the book, but uh, hopefully I can maybe do a, a like I said, a history and weather thing. It, it might be an interesting kind of way to take this based on some of the things I learned. But sticking to just this cave component, their origin story, you know, the long and the short of it is that their people came out of this cave, right? That's where they came from. And I started wondering how equally weird, right? I mean, imagine going in and losing your weather, but how equally just bizarre it must fail if you go into a scenario where the only thing you've known, well, number one is darkness. And just, but let's get aside from that. It's got to be weird just to go from darkness to light, all right? And, you know, hopefully they have good sunglasses. But going up and experiencing weather for the first time, changes for the first time. Because the whole idea of the story is how difficult it is to like hunt and gather and do all the things for survival. But I'm thinking about, it's not just, you know, that aspect of it, but just think about dealing with things like thunderstorms or winds or high, high temperatures and snowstorms and all this. Because this is a region that, that can experience drastic extremes from winter to summer right? Really hot days to really cold days, depending on the season. And I, I just sat there and wondered, okay, I think it's freaky to go one way. It's got to be freaky to go the other way, but would, would I, you know, would there be some percentage that's like me and go, oh, this is kind of cool. I like this idea. I like getting out and enjoying this weather thing. Or would the vast majority go, no, I want to go back to the cave, this, this heat thing is is overwhelming and another cave that i visited and this is another thing i've seen i i don't i don't like calling it a cave it is one but it's more of like an opening with a big rock covering and you know clearly sometime a many million millions of years ago you know a sea carved out kind of a, a a shallow into a rock if you will and so it's a protective what i call a protective covering cave and it's not a closed entrance but it's a place where one you're not going to get rained on but but you see the world going on around you. You'd still be able to see thunderstorms. And while it's cool because the sun's not beating down, the temperature is heating up just outside the cave. So it's going to get hot and it's still going to get cold and all those things. So it's not exactly the same. But these caves never changed. To me, again, boring. To you, maybe not. Maybe you think that'd be a great idea. To the Lakota doing the opposite of that, maybe freaky on the other hand maybe really exciting and experiencing those you know the simple things like you know breezes and rain and snow and all the joy those things can bring right and they're non-extreme forms or they're non-life-threatening forms and maybe you know they were the ones who started conversations about the weather i i don't know i don't know let me know what you think. I'd be curious to know if you think you could really live in a constant weather environment or if you would just find it dull and, you know, just make life seem that much more dull. You know how to reach me. What is about the weather? Gmail.com. What is about the weather on Twitter? Mark underscore Jelonic on Twitter. Any of those things work. I'd be glad if you drop a line. Let me know what you think. If you don't have a thought about it, you don't have to. It's real easy. As always, I welcome your conversations and your thoughts. I always enjoy interacting with you guys. But just keep in mind, the next time you feel the morning dew, like I have been in the South, right, as much as I like to 
talk about how hot it is. I actually like taking going out barefoot in fresh dew grass and just feeling that morning moisture. It's like a cleaning sort of moisture just under my feet. I really do enjoy that. Or maybe the next time you feel the breeze along a beach coast, just walk along the shore at sunset. Just remember, there's much more to weather than the weather itself.